all last night. I was trying to, I was thinking about the pictures of all the great work that you did yesterday. And I was thinking about how can I help you the most. And I came back to the realization that a lot of how I can help you is to have you help me. Again, we saw yesterday there's a lot of really passionate teachers in this room. The discussions were really animated, and I thank you for that. And so we're going to build on that. So that, of course, this isn't just a two-day workshop. It's also moving forward. The people in the room with you will be with you as you move forward. So I just wanted to quickly summarize, you know, if you were there yesterday, summarize a lot of the ideas that we explored and struggled with and tried to understand. I mean, our overall goal, of course, is our students and trying to help them as much as we can wherever they're coming from. And if that also means that you get to be, have lots of really satisfying moments in your classroom, where you see the light bulb go on. You see the student go from frustration, confusion, to, oh, I get it now. You can do that every day with me. We talked about how teaching is a scholarly activity, and this is not universally accepted, but it's something that I have believed in, and I have seen the data and read the data. And even though it's hard to do these experiments, because can't control all the variables the same way we do in a physics class or a chemistry class. A chemistry class, we still can get trends. Trends like interactive engagement works on average much, much better than traditional lectures. We talked about peer instruction. It's the most well-known interactive engagement technique. It comes for many reasons. One of them being it can be used anywhere. You have 20 students. You have at Cranter, at uh, Arizona, 1,100 students in the room. And you can make use of peer instruction. You can make, help your students become teachers with you. And they will like you. They love talking to each other and arguing and debating. And I had to challenge that they got too good at it. And I had to figure out a way of shutting them up. when I did still want to talk to them. But it worked well by just giving them another concept question. We talked about how one way of doing it, and definitely not everyone implements it this way, but please don't take out the peer discussion from the peer interaction. Even if the content monster, you remember that content monster? The content monster is telling you you need to go through fast, quicker, more content. Which is more important, content or learning? How to understand better how to teach, open a new channel. And we have ideas of creating a new feedback channel. If I'm doing laser machines, I need to know how deep my laser is going into the steel. And I need to know that not 10 seconds later or a week later, I need to know when it's happening. It's the same with my teaching. I need to know what's happening in the room in my students. The very simple feedback channel that I had was I asked a simple question and I got to the back of the room. And for me that was uh, very important because I realized my data that I had up to the point, the data that came from a few students who sat in the front, was not good data. It was highly biased. And I should have made decisions about the teaching based on highly biased data. You can test your own teaching. And certainly I can uh, you could Google search this, or I could provide you a link for conceptual surveys that are in physics, they exist in chemistry, in optics, quantum mechanics, mathematics, and you can give this to your students in the first week to see where they're at as a diagnostic, and then your 16th week of your term, to see how well it is, and then you can compare against other populations. I love telling my students, hey, you did better than MIT or you did better than Harvard. If we do, if we don't, well, then we work hard. Don't let the content monster tell you what to do. Yes, you do have a lot of important information to tell students, but just telling it to them doesn't mean they're learning. It's always about learning. And part of that, of course, is helping students prepare, figure out what their questions are. Whether you want to use 
use some sort of other format for delivering content. Be it just assigning reading or video or a clickable YouTube videos that you have to Whatever it is, no matter what though, you have to give the students many incentives. It will not work if you say, do it, it's good for you. It will work though if you give them many reasons, and I would say positive reasons to do it, including you use their feedback to set the lecture topic. And you show them afterwards, the students who were doing the advanced readings were doing much better on tests than the students who were not doing the advanced readings. So you have to keep giving them this information, giving them feedback on how things are going. Peer instruction. We talked about this, you have to launch it well. And there's a, a specific format that I follow that I learned from Ed with his 1,100 students. Because you don't want it to go slowly, you don't want it to drag. So even that magic word at the end when you launch them up, go, is very important so that they know it's the cue for them to turn physically and talk to their neighbor. And it, you don't want it to take very long, you want it to move quickly. And if the cell phones come out, it's time to finish and move on. Alright, so let's take a step back and see what I just did. I just delivered content. I just passively lectured to you. Uh, I wasn't very satisfied with that. So I thought, well, I'd give you a diagnostic. So I hope you have your clickers. Actually, does anyone not have a clicker? Okay. <laughs> And again, we talked a bit about the literature. To help your students learn, you want to give them many chances to retrieve the information and think about it. So that's what we're doing. And I thought I should model what I claim is the right way of teaching. So it says, and I'll do this for the, the translators, using peer instruction in your course means that your course cannot cover as much content. You have to reduce the syllabus.
So before, nothing was over. Nothing was over forty percent. A had twenty-five percent, and now we've gone strongly to C. And that's, I think, really interesting. Yeah. I'll tell you my experience. When I say poll around a concept test, I would poll at least almost always two times. So I'm not saying how many concept test questions you get. I am saying, so I hope that was, I didn't mean that to be a trick. It's how many times you poll the students to get their feedback. So in my 50 minute class, I went and looked at the data just to make sure. My 50 minute class this last term, I'm averaging 22 times in a 50 minute class. Because it's got to move fast. And so I will sometimes let all the parents start. I can sort of slower with you folks, because frankly, your discussions seem really interesting, even though I don't understand them. They look very interesting. <laughs> and so I've been letting you go longer than I would in my first year or my fourth year. Anyway, so again, I would say, if you're only planning to do that, your students are going to wide bother with only using it a few times. It seems like it's, you're just taking it They do All right, let's keep going. This is a straight memory recall question, so it's not a very good question. It says, after the first poll, you should launch your students into peer instruction if at least that percentage was correct. All right. We're not where we need to be, or at least you don't agree <laughs> with each other. So please turn to your neighbor, try and convince them your answer is right. You have only 45 seconds, though. Go. <laughs>
So this, of course, is, uh, I don't know what the right answer is, because I'm asking for your opinion. Mm -hmm. So your opinion is, uh, of course you should know that, I hope you're telling me your true opinion. And I think that's interesting, that most of you are saying that it's okay that a student is bothered. In fact, maybe it's good that if a student is getting the wrong answer, that they emotionally are a bit upset about it and they want to come and talk to you. And this is one of the things that I found with peer instruction. Before, when I delivered my beautiful lectures, the students would nod, and they'd leave, and then on the exam they'd say, oh, I thought I knew everything, but when I came into the test, it turned out then I realized I didn't know. Now, first week, first class, they're realizing that there are gaps in their understanding. Because you're giving them good quality feedback. And that is absolutely essential for interactive education. Uh, I'm not going to go through the entire day of this. What do I want? Let's not do that one. Uh, I want this, I think, is uh, one that we didn't cover at all yesterday. So I'm curious about what you think. Sir. 
circlet, uh, with your laser pointer, or with if you're using a PowerPoint, you can use a marker, or if you use a tablet, you can circle it. But you do need to make it very clear for those students, especially that the 10% you got it wrong. We didn't discuss this, but I, I'm curious to see what you think. Yeah. Yeah. Google Translation didn't work properly. 
Group one will be passing over their sheet to group two. Group two to group three, group three to group four, and group four will be passing it over to group one. So that's the relationship that you're going to be having over the next period. Are there any outcome on the microphone? Are there, I will walk through this step by step, but are there any questions at this point? So, you have five minutes for step one. Please, in your groups, if you want, add to your list of options. <laughs>
recibiendo la capacitación como 8 o 10 profesores. Entonces, que se acepte a nivel de cátedra la separación de dos, los que quieran trabajar con la pero para eso se necesita capacitación y seguimiento. Sí, que haya algo más. Tenemos una serie de problemas. So, I did want to give you some ideas because I wanted to make sure that you did things outside of the box. I hope, though, that you're engaged in the problem. These are your colleagues, and you're trying to help them. And I think that that is something that works very well for not just us, but for our students. So, I wanted to just give you some, maybe uh, some ideas for you to consider. Some of them I've seen implemented to overcome some of the obstacles. Some of them are a bit crazy. And some of them are quite conservative. But just to, I'll call, uh, just to give you, uh, again, to have you think about this from different perspectives. So, you know, some of the challenges are materials. Well, Google can be your friend, of course. And I had someone asking me about computer science concept tests yesterday. And I actually found, just last night, found a link uh, on that, and I didn't know it existed uh, ahead of time. So it's, it's one of those things that new materials are coming up all the time. Within your institution, determine what resources there are to help you transition a course, or to become a better teacher. Well, why not create a new website? You would become the new website that anyone who wants Spanish materials on concept tests or on interactive engagement, they would send those links to you. So you would become the central depository for that. You have clearly uh, become a, a, a learning community here. I can tell that you're helping each other, that you clearly trust each other. If you didn't, whenever I asked you to do a group activity, you just sort of sit like this with your arms full. That's not this group. You could form a, a support group with your colleagues and practice teaching them. How about getting your students to be engaged in the material? This is something I do. From volunteers in your class, form an advisory council that you meet with them informally, maybe over a coffee, to discuss things with them. Ask for money. So, Perhaps you can ask your institution to help you hire a student to help you transition a course. And I recommend maybe if you make that request, you use technical jargon that might sound good to an administrator, like blended learning, where you're using technology to enable learning, or the flipped classroom, practically. This is something that someone in my institution did, and I think they were brilliant. They created a new course for students called Innovative Teaching Techniques for Post-Secondary Education. So they taught this, and of course they learned about it while they were teaching it. And the really smart part of it, all the students had to have practical experience. The students went and helped other professors in their tutorials and wrote reports on it. So it worked at so many levels. And this course was so popular among the students that they actually have to apply to get in because there's only a certain number of positions at my school. Why not become an education researcher? Do a study with your students. Publish it or present it at a conference. You can have an independent observer come and observe student engagement. And there's ways of measuring that. There are protocols for doing that. We worry about time. Well, why not measure it? Measure how much time you teach and how much time you prepare for teaching in a course. And I don't think we can really comment on time unless we know how much time there is. How about propose to the university that there's a new award at the institute? You know, most innovative teacher. And I kind of like this because the short form would be MIT at tech. 
I thought that was kind of fun. <laughs> All right. And how about get the rector to, to come and visit your classroom and see what it's like? I actually did this, and to my surprise, he showed up <laughs> at my institution. He's an economics uh, researcher. He didn't understand any of the physics, but he certainly understood the students interacting and discussing. And it turned out that that was actually has been beneficial to me to do that, to reach out to him and have him show up. I gave him a clicker. He got most of the answers wrong. <laughs> but he understood that the students were engaged. Anyway, so, your task though. These are just a bunch of ideas just to get you thinking about this from many different points of view and many different perspectives. But you have to find out something that you think is going to help your colleagues. So right now we have about 10 minutes, only 10 minutes, for you to come up with some solutions and you're going to report back to your client. I will be around in the room with my, my most helpful translators if you would like to ask a question. Go!
dando un, un taller de inducción a, tal, eh, a los estudiantes para que les hable de los responsables de su propia educación. Eh, que la que nos da mucho susto, que es confiar en los estudiantes y que lo pueden hacer, pues si ustedes son capaces de hacerlo, eh, exactamente, y, 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 y esperar que funcione. Eh, y hablamos de que la gente queda muy rápidamente, que no están viendo la reglamentación, eh, hablar directamente con ellos. Y bueno, esto es importante por tal y tal, lo que hablaba de darles muchas razones, y bueno, los quedamos desmotivados, pues darles todavía más. Eh, así. Respecto al del de, idioma, eh, aunque no es lo más correcto, pueden arrancar con, con traductores en línea eh, y de ahí, tarde o temprano, también motivar que, de, que en realidad, como estudiantes universitarios, tienen que aprender una segunda lengua que tiende a ser inglés en ¿no? Eh, y la otra cosa que nos ocurre y que puede ser útil es que nosotros nos atrevamos a generar nuestro propio material. Eh, problema 3. Resistencia al cambio, que es algo que reconocemos claramente, creo que básicamente lo tenemos todos. Siempre como a las cosas que Nos parece que, bueno, esto que estamos haciendo nosotros habría que hacerlo con más profesores, en mucha lectura todavía más de la que tuvimos y escuchar muchas experiencias de otras personas. Y no solo para los profesores, sino también hacer esto mismo, pero para los estudiantes que reconozcan, digamos, ojalá lograr, digamos, que nos manden experiencias de los alumnos cuando, cuando les preguntaban en esas universidades, cuando les preguntaban qué sentían respecto al curso, para que ellos también conecten con esa con, con esta idea. Costumbres de sentirse, digamos, cómodos. Si y justamente, pues, pues también la ahí, eh, pensamos que esa comunidad es... Eh, puede ser bueno, un poco movida a un lado o al otro, ¿verdad? En este caso, al lado de la innovación, tanto por los impulsos interiores como el ser instinto que pues, todos los padres como profesores, como por esta corriente eh, institucional, ¿verdad? De crear un centro de innovación que muestre y evidencie, ¿verdad? Las experiencias que tiene el instituto, el estudiante, el profesor también, ¿verdad? A través de pues, crecimiento como investigador en la educación, como pues, en su escalafón docente, ¿verdad? A través de, de innovación. Y eso haría que las personas que profesores de otras materias de matemáticas inteligentes, ahora hay material, digamos, eh, celulares muy muy baratos inteligentes y de hecho lo que hemos visto todos, sin, sin estar buscando demasiado, pero porque lo vemos, saca los celulares en la clase, es que el 90% de los estudiantes tienen un celular inteligente de la marca que sea. Entonces, podríamos utilizar esos celulares en los que todos no tengan acceso, comenzar a la institución de hacer una inversión menor, pero digamos que la biblioteca entonces tenga un banco de unas cantidad de tablets o y que esos estudiantes blandamente que, que, no, o sea, que no tengan, vayan y lo saquen con sus tenemos. Y la otra que nos ocurre es que es un tema de tecnológico que estamos preparando el futuro de la nación y solicitar donaciones para que... Bueno, y la otra cosa que realmente convertamos, pero no, pero no, lo que hagamos de tiempo es que si en algún momento este, este plan se hace tiempo de una norma en el tecnológico y ellos lo van a utilizar en matemática, en química, en biología, en física, por lo menos, que no estaría pegado si el pensar que ellos tuvieran adquirido sus propios críticos, porque lo van a utilizar en todo. Pero bueno, eso es también otro That is just, I mean, so many great ideas. I saw some of you taking pictures of some of the solutions as a record. That's great, I think you should. What I heard was, um, okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you end up doing work, even though you weren't the planning. What I heard was things working on many levels. Some of you have grand visions you should have grand visions about what you want your institution and you want your institution to lead. And some of you have very immediate, oh, there's three, three, and some of you have very concrete, immediate steps. For instance, 
students talking about why not target the students as the very first class when they come to your university. They already know that it's going to be very different than high school. So why not make use of that opportunity? And that's exactly what I have found very successful. In September, that first year, those students are scared. They don't know what to expect. And so I help them understand, and I train them in this technique. And they pick up on it very quickly, and they're very receptive to change. In my fourth year course, that's harder. I still work with them, though, but there are a few who still resist much more. In my first year class, even though I have 200 students, I have no one to resist. Well, in the fourth year class, I say 20% don't understand and don't, they, they don't know why I'm changing the rules at the end of their four years. Uh, so identifying particular areas where you could make change, figuring out what might do well, is a great idea, certainly. I'm not even, I can't even go through all these ideas. I hope, though, that all of you get a chance to look at the others, the ones that you didn't get a chance to look at, um, so that you can get a sense of them. There was also one discussion I just wanted to mention. What about the students who are weak? Is this technique going to hurt them more? So those students who maybe are failing repeatedly. And from what I've read in the literature, again these are for other students, but from what I've read in the literature, having all that feedback to those students helps them a great deal. And also when they realize that their colleagues can help them and answer some of their questions. So they're not just stuck alone. I always worry most about the students who feel that they're alone, so they can't do it, and they don't reach out for help, and they can. But if you can help them trust their colleagues, and help them understand that their colleagues are good teachers, then you're going to help those very good students. Much better than you can help them when you're standing at the front and you have 30 or 70 students in total. So I'll say, and also one final thing, why not study it? Why not try a change and evaluate the end result? And education research needs always greater validation to help us understand better what works and what doesn't. That's the only way the science can move forward. And I certainly heard some of you talking about that in ideas of research projects that you can do. Oh, that's great. All right. We're in the last two hours of our time together, at least now. Though I did on one of my slides put my email. And certainly you can always search for Fraser Queens and you'll find me. And so certainly down the road, if you want to send me an email, uh, please do if you have questions or comments. Or if you want to see the slides that I use for my students to convince them that this is a good approach. I'm very, I mean, more than willing to share this, and if that helps you, it will be in English. We can see if Google Translate works on PowerPoint slides. Yeah. So if someone else should translate it, someone is waving at me. What am I doing?
trying to tell me that I had to, oh, I have to tell you this, and 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 I have to tell you this. And that's why I said, no, that's not the right way. Go away, content monster. And that's why I did that, that little diagnostic this morning, just so that we could reflect on things. Certainly when you ask for more time, when I was rushing you, I, I said, sure, let's, let's have more time. So, I mean, in two days, how can I try and give you all the things I think are important that's taken me 10 years to learn it? Nonetheless, in terms of things that you wanted, there was definitely a request for concrete, um, making your own concept test. And so what I have is an activity, and I have to say, oh, actually, I should, I should actually launch that so that I can uh, explain it to you. So first off, I really want to thank um, Eric Uzer and Julie Schell for agreeing to let me use this with you. I've been in discussions about this workshop with them. And so this material comes from them. And any uh, errors in the Spanish translation isn't due to me or to our excellent translators, it's the that, or the people who are helping them. The idea is to just give you a concrete way of evaluating these questions before you put them in front of your students. Yeah, I'll tell you that uh, perhaps your textbook producer would provide for you clicker questions. I'm not sure where that's at. Most of them are bad because they don't understand. They tend to want to give questions that are straight memorization questions, vocabulary questions. And that's not going to get interesting peer discussion. It's just, do you remember it or you don't? That's not what we're trying to teach our students either. We want them to be much, much higher up than just memorizing All right, so the way for you to understand how to create your own concept test in your own discipline is to first analyze other ones and decide what are good and what are bad. But you need a framework. So certainly for the education specialists in the, in the room, you'll recognize this as something called Bloom's taxonomy. And you can think about it as being, we want to take students who are below this, don't even know the facts. So this would be remembering knowledge. We want to bring them up from remembering, actually comprehending, to being able to apply it to problems, to be able to analyze, evaluate, and even to create us. Now that's very hard to get all that. But what I find when I look at the textbook questions that they give, they're just And this exercise is to allow you to analyze some concept tests because you're going to be able to go out and access resources of other concept tests, and you want to be able to determine ahead of time before you use them. Are they going to be good or not? So, I've given you some sheets of paper. One of them has some terms on them to help you understand. Again, going from this is the lowest level, some words that are associated with that. And this was me doing this last night on Google Translate. Mm -hmm. I hope it's kind of all right. If there's a word that doesn't make sense, that's my point. But again, it's just as for illustration, for, to try and give a little bit more understanding. I thought this was too minimal, so I wanted to give a bit more understanding to what these levels are at, for those of you who have made use of the taxonomy. This case study, we've had enough of physics, I think. So the case study we have is a math problem that I know many of you are involved in mathematics or actually instructing mathematics. And it's quite simply, students have already read or saw a video on Pythagorean theorem, and now they're in your class and you're helping them to try and really understand it and move up that level of, of knowledge. And so what we have then is these sheets. Now we have a bunch of questions. We're not going to do them all. So I just want to set expectations immediately. We're only going to aim to be able to analyze 
three of them. And the instructions are on the front. So, again, if you can individually go through those first three steps, but only do three of the questions. Certainly, you can, you'll be taking these away with you. If you want to do them all later, you're more than welcome to do that. But I, frankly, I think doing three will really get the point across. We don't need to do all three. And then you're going to be working in your groups or in pairs within your groups to compare results and to discuss. Now, just so that I can have a bit of sense of how things are going, could you, when you're done this step, just on your clicker, click A, and that way I'll be able to have a sense of how things are going. And when you're done that step, if you could click B, so I know that you're ready to move. Now, I'm sure there's questions, though. Uh, well, are there any questions? I'll certainly be here if you do have any questions. All right, please, please go ahead. Uh, so the first part is individually, and then the second part in there. I mean, if you want to talk in the first part too, that's fine. But it's just to give you a sense of speed and to understand the, uh, the information. Even though we're trying to get students here, 
If they're down there, we can't ask them that question. So that might have come out with that. What is a good question really depends on where your students are. And you want to move them through these levels. So we looked at just three questions. Frankly, they're the most extreme. And I hope that maybe some of you had extra time. You took a, a look at some of the, the question four, five, and six, which are a little bit more traditional, I would say. So it would fill in the, the gap maybe in the middle. So you can certainly, at, at a later, after the workshop, they can make use of that. Uh, let me ask you, though, and I would like to know what you think. You know, what did, you know, which of those three questions did you put lowest? Let me uh, close the poll. Sorry, I want to reopen it. Which of those three questions did you put lowest in terms of taxonomy? Low being memorization. So, in other words, if you thought Anna, the question about Anna, was just a memorization question, then you would put that, that was the lowest on Luke's taxonomy, and you would say, what, A. All right, so I'll at least click in if you haven't had a chance. So I'll show you the, uh, the results of what you think. So most of you were putting question two as being the lowest level of understanding, quality of understanding. And, and I would agree with that. There is also something, I'd say, wrong about question two. In terms of what is it actually helping students learn. If you're trying to help students understand Pythagorean theorem, is question two helping them understand that? So, so maybe that's, well, let's, let's see where you put the different questions in. That was the lowest. Uh, which question did you put highest? So again, sorry, let me open the door. So between Anna and Brian, which one do you think requires the highest level of comprehension or understanding? Please click in if you haven't had a chance. That's interesting. This room is very, very confident in that. And my opinion, I'm not actually sure, right? I put uh, the Anna question at a very similar level to the Brian question. Uh, in terms of understanding or in terms of thinking. Uh, nonetheless, there's no, no, there's no straight rule on this. It is a matter of interpretation. Nonetheless, it's useful to be aware of these things when you're creating your own question. Let me ask the, the following thing. Let's go back to question two. So the question that you had the lowest uh, in terms of what was the value of C. Can I give the microphone to someone and ask them to um, tell us what was a better question than question two? I'll tell you, please. Yo lo que hice fue asociarlo con, con el teorema de la siguiente manera. Lo que hice fue, eh, bueno, 
planeta por metro cuadrado pequeño tiene un área de 3200 cuadrados por dos unidades. Uno mediano tiene un área de 4200 cuadrados. ¿Cuál es el lado de un cuadrado cuya área es igual a la de los dos primeros cuadrados?
I think you would agree that 2 plus 3 equals question mark isn't really the analysis that we want the students to get to. So I think this might be a problem with my Google translation. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Let's blame Google. Because I think that when they say calculate, it's more the idea of here's a word problem. How do you actually end up interpreting it to be able to do a calculation? Do you have a, something that you want to add? Please. Tal vez esto es un ejemplo eh, que, que los verbos no son la única referencia a nivel de, económico de un, de un activo o un objetivo. El ejemplo que yo les doy cuando, cuando trabajo con los profesores de este tema es, por ejemplo, clasificar. Es muy diferente entre un niño de eh, preescolar, que por color, la que lo sea que el niño clasifique por color en las plataformas, que decirle a un taxónomo clasifique. Eh, un grupo de insectos claro, que se nivel, o sea, no solamente los niveles, lo que se pide que se haga es adicionar la condición eh, que también determina la creación de activos si, si hablamos de una prueba escrita como la que se ha No, I, I certainly agree that we have to be very careful about just using single words or verbs to try and communicate level of understanding that said, having some framework and a framework that you're comfortable with, whether it's Bloom's taxonomy, at my university actually we use a simpler one, which we call ICE Ideas, Connections, Extensions. So there's only three levels. And why that's very popular at my university is because it's simple. And certainly I'd say in my world of physics, the ideas of physics is very distinct, separate from making the connections, and that's quite distinct to the extensions. The most important thing is to come up with a framework that works for you and apply it when you're evaluating these kinds of questions. And make use of resources of people who can suggest frameworks that might work for you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, and I hope you keep those sheets and maybe have further discussions about those. What I want to do is we are in the last 40 minutes, and it's important that we end on time because of that picture and because of lunch. So I just wanted to give us our finale and, and talk to you. I'll show you what that is. So, again, as I said last night, it was me struggling with the concept, the content piece, because I wanted to tell you so many things and share so many things, but I knew that wasn't the right thing. So what I just wanted to pick were some of the things I still felt we kind of dealt with that you'd asked about and was a great interest yesterday in terms of technological solutions. Very quick on assessment. And part of this is because I don't think the literature is, has really determined what is the best way. So I can talk about some best practices I've seen, but I don't think they have been really tested. And then, just to summarize what we've explored, and have you at the very last activity, you'll be going back to your groups and determining one more sheet of paper, where do you go from here? All right, so in terms of technological solutions, why is it so important? We go back to this idea from hate. Uh, we want interactive engagement with our students. And it's really hard to do this. This immediate individual feedback. It's hard to do that with your 70 students or even your 30 students. But if we make use of technology now, we have some hope for it. And certainly I think everyone in this room is quite comfortable with technology and would like to harness technology for better, for better learning and also so that it takes us less time. So, just in terms of some of the functionality, we've already talked about a bunch of these. I wanted to just, so what have we already talked about? I mean, we used flashcards yesterday. The batteries never run out. You don't have to worry about the wireless router. 
being able to have enough connections for every student with those. So they're always a good fallback. And even if you forget flashcards, you can go back to hands. The only the important thing is that students, it needs to be anonymous. If a student you know, puts up their hand, one or two or three, everyone's going to be looking around. So it's very simple. The way I learned was you vote on your chest. One, two, three. Now, that gets actually a lot of what we want in terms of being able to collect feedback from the students to the professor. And even if you forget the flashcards, you still have those. I wanted, we already talked about using dedicated clickers. I use my university iClicker, but here we were using Turner Point. They never crash. They always work, at least in my experience. But they require the students to purchase them. Uh, I'll say that with some of these, they actually do have the ability for students not to buy the handheld, but to use their cell phone, their smartphones. But they have to have that access. But at least they're not carrying around another device. So that might be a bit. We also talked about the more sophisticated techniques, including yesterday, one of you mentioned Socrative. And I had a discussion about another one of you about that, so I just want to talk about that. And then a, a website that I use, Shark Scholar. The challenge of these, they give us a great deal of functionality, they are more complex, and the other problem is plan. So, let's talk about this one though, visual peer instruction. That's just a way of taking the peer instruction ideas that we have and pushing them a little bit farther, especially when we care about skills. So I'll tell you a comment from a past workshop participant, someone who was in the room, they put up their hand after we did their instruction, and they said, if you're spending so much time on concepts, well, what about the students solving quantitative problems? You know, being able to do a calculation, a true calculation, at that, that higher level, that, that higher level of analysis. And it really is possible. One way that I wanted to, we did it, I'll talk about it. I think it's important though that we make sure that we understand or agree on what we mean in terms of problem solving skills. Because from what I read, we have a big problem. That for some of our students, they think the right way to learn how to do solutions is to memorize solutions. And they use techniques of pattern recognition. Oh, he asked about the length. He told me about the length, and he told me about the time. Problems before that had length and time, I did L divided by T. That gives me the answer. There's no conceptual understanding. And it's, some students actually do fine on exams using pattern recognition. We don't want that, though. We want more than that. We want students to be able to make those connections, to move up. Bloom's taxonomy, or whatever taxonomy you want, to become versatile problem solvers, whether that's in math, chemistry, biology, physics. So, this would be a, a tutorial in one of my courses. And the students, you can see, are working around these super high-tech uh, whiteboards. I didn't get, remember, at the MIT, they have those beautiful touchscreen displays that cost, I don't know, how many thousands of dollars. Well, I didn't have those. This is my touch screen tablet. <laughs> and it just requires markers. And that would be either me or that's my uh, assistant. Uh, this is a big course. I have 200 students, so I do have some teaching team to help me. Uh, working with the students in these groups of 30. The way that we do tutorials, it used to be that the tutorial leader would go up to the board and write up solutions on the board. And we tested it and it wasn't working. The students weren't learning. Now, the students are doing the problems and we're helping them. We're their mentors. So, we put the, the students into teams with a range of abilities, but, and I talked about beforehand, my minority gender, in other words, female students in a physics class, are a majority within a group. And this is to produce something called minority friend. If you feel different than the people you're with, it's hard to learn. And then we give them problems, and we have rules. One of them is called the marker rule. See, this fellow grabbed the marker right at the beginning. Because our marker rule is you're not allowed to write unless someone tells you what to write. And you 
can see why we do this. And so let's say this student who thinks they're really sure and they know all the answers, so they don't just grab the marker and start answering the solution. At the very least, this student has to tell that student, and that student has to understand. So the, we have a joke in the class. If you're having a bad day, and your brain is just not working, grab the marker. <laughs> and they do it, it's, it's, it's funny. But you know how what happens. This person isn't just going to write down anything. They're going to be processing what this person is saying as they work through the book. So this is just one technique that we use for, we call it visual peer instruction. And one of the great values of it is I, in a room of 30, and I actually will even do this in my fourth year course during the lecture, and there's about 40 students, I can quickly see on the boards what groups need my help. Because those are the blank boards. Something with just peer interaction, it's hard to know which groups are talking about the, the problem on the board and which one that they thought would work very well in this format. And they were important concepts for them. I don't understand any of this because uh, I'm not a biologist. But it's just to give you a flavor of that this is certainly not just for physics. All right. So that's just brief. Let's talk about supercharging your courses with even more technology, if you want. I hope you've got the sense, though, that I am a... I don't really care about the technology unless it helps learn. So we talked about Socratic, and one of you actually mentioned it. I haven't heard about it before yesterday. So I was just looking into it because it was, for me, it was astounding. It was free. I thought this was great. And I'll just say I went through their website and I found this one little sentence. Don't miss this amazing opportunity to enjoy our products while they are free of charge. Uh, so be careful about that. If you start developing a course around some of this technology that you don't have control of, they might put up a paywall and they might start charging. So, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid it's not as good as, as I was hoping. Still, right now you can do it for free, you can try it out. And yesterday we talked about maybe you would develop a solution here. Well, why not have, look at what they're doing in functionality and try and recreate it. Whatever, whatever works. And then you can control it and you can control your data. Alright, so the last step of technology then, I just wanted to give you a sense of what I do in an upper year course. Uh, also, to give you the sense that peer instruction is not just for your lower level students, it's also for the, it can be a very technical course. And it's to show you how a more web enabled platform gives you more flexibility. So, we've actually developed, put together just a little, very tiny little class so you can have the experience that, that my students have. I think most of you have a laptop. If you don't, please team up with someone who does. And please go to this website and click sign up. Sign up is that you Your email is a at a.com. 
for a one. This doesn't matter, but you do need technological code to do that. For students, that might be some hassle for first class, but they get used to it. And this now gives you a bit of the environment that students would be having beforehand. And for those of you, um, particularly if you're on a computer, now that you're on a, a smartphone, you could be using this site also for your smartphone, but you're able to follow along on your screen with the same things that we would be discussing in this class. So, this particular website sees that their real way that they're going to do well is by providing to professors more analytics, more data during the class. So how does it work? The teacher, the professor, would create the free class reading or assignment. I use just PDF, but some professors do use video. The students would be completing that lesson ahead of time. And then I, as a professor, get information about what students are doing are present. Are they getting answers right or wrong? And I can track that. And then what parts of the readings even they're having trouble with. It will monitor if they're staying a lot of time on page three. If they're asking a lot of questions about page five. And so ahead of time, we're able to get that information. So just to give you an example of this, for my fourth year labor office course, this would be the reading. And some of the functionality that I like, and certainly if you decide to create your own sort of resource for this, it's very nice to have the ability to put in annotation for it so I can comment to the students. Oh, in this section, this is very important because it's so it's a guided reading. And that I think is important. It helps students learn how to read technical documents. Also, I can be asking questions as they're going through the reading and give them feedback on those questions, whether they got it right or wrong, right when they're doing the reading. Yes. And that's certainly better than what I'm able to implement in my first year course, where they don't know when they answer the question if they got it right or wrong. So now when they're doing the reading, they get a better sense of they're mastering the material. So they will tell me as they're going along whether they are they change this meter. Is this hard? Is it easy? They answer questions. And then this is extremely valuable. Right in the margin of the reading, they can ask a question. And sometimes their peers will answer to it, or I will answer to it. And this is all done anonymously. Again, we think that it's valuable for students to know, not feel that risk. And I, it's anonymous to each other, I should make that clear. It's not anonymous to me. So this introduces many feedback channels that you could be providing to the students. Let me give you sort of an example sort of lecture. So this was from my class, these were comments that students had given me the night before about a particular idea in laser optics, namely saturation. So I took this information and I was able to ask them this question. And what we'll do now is, even though I'm assuming none of you are experts in lasers, I can ask you that question, and on your screen, you should populate a little question box, A, B, or C, and then you can then respond to on the left-hand side of your screen. Interesting, I'm not seeing it on the tablets. All right. Part of the problems also with technology is how do you make sure that your technology works on everybody's different device? So I don't know why it's not working on tablets. It's working, but I've seen them in multiple tablets. Oh, your tablets work. What's the different types of tablets? Anyway, so click in though on that left hand side if you have it. A, B, or C. And right now I have to send an email to the developers asking why on this tablet it didn't work. I don't know why. So, these are the risks. And I am getting on my 
my screen now that the seven of you have managed to open that. So this is what I'm seeing on my screen. Oh, it's, it's half and half. I would never show students this. It just your professors that you can uh, understand to the back end. Right now, it's half and half between A and B. And B is correct. So congratulations. All right. So I'm able to go through an analysis. I can go through a relatively detailed analysis of the students. I can stop and ask them more questions as we go along. So it will certainly be very technical. So I'll ask you this question. Populated. Now, the devices that are Oh, I should read it, sorry. How long before class do you think I have this live prepared and online? Should I have this the night before? Is it ready to go at 9 a.m. the day of? One hour before the lecture or five minutes before the lecture? Because, of course, I have to take my slides, PDF them, and upload them to the website so that the students can have them on their own devices. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, hey, I'm not being clear. We're not using the clickers right now. On your computer screen, there should be a box in the left-hand side of your computer screen that you can pick the letter. I'm sorry, that wasn't clear. So if you click the letter and then click Submit. So on the computer, you see me? With this sort of technology, you don't need to click The students can already use their web-enabled device. All right, I'll show you the results. It's uh, quite a mix. Most of you think I haven't done the night before, though, and that's not the case at all. <laughs> that's five minutes before. I'm uploading them. Because I'm always changing them and trying to think of some way to do it better, and that's fine. The technology works and it's okay. So, I thank you, though, thinking that I'm so well prepared, but I'm not. <laughs> All right. So, let's move back then. That was just to give you a quick, brief uh, taste of technology. You can imagine it does introduce some additional risks, but it has also great benefits in terms of the richness. I can get on my front end people sending me anonymous puns if, if I wanted to have that functionality. I don't know if that's actually the best thing. Alright, so then let's go back. I'm going to be very, very quick about assessment. And part of the reason is because I don't think I'm an assessment expert at all. I don't think the literature is great on this, saying what's the right way of doing it. I can at least give you a sense though, for instance, in a first year course where I put the grades. Under the understanding that exams, so this is eight months actually, it's a full year of course. The exams are still 25 plus 25 plus 10, so they're still 60% of the grade. But I value the students coming to class and contributing. I value the students asking good questions the night before. We're also able to do students doing some problem sets, whether that's within the tutorial or else. So this is just to give you a bit of a sense. I do think that if you don't, if you try and have a student do something but there's no grades involved with it, well, they're busy people. They probably won't do it. All right. So I wanted one other aspect of assessment. And from my understand, for many of you, the standard format is the final exam. And in fact, all, if I understand correctly, a lot of your course weight is all about the exam. 
now we have a bit of a problem. We're asking students to learn how to be an effective group member in class, to learn from each other. And then we stick them all alone in a high stakes environment that's incredibly artificial and ask them to perform. Now, I'm certainly not going to say completely get rid of that, though some educational experts would say that this is the only, this was only serving the needs of the teacher and not to serve the needs of the student. Nonetheless, that is certainly at my institution and I understand your institution is the norm to make sure students have individual accountability. I wanted to just give you a, a bit of a sense of new research that's been coming out, and I'm quite excited about it. That really allows us to transition this so it's a little bit more like this, and it turns the exams into a learning environment. And you certainly could do that. It's known as the two-stage exam, and it's very straightforward and simple. The first two hours, instead of just having one long three-hour exam, the first two hours students complete the exam individually, and they hand it in. That makes sure there's individual accountability. And then the second hour, they redo the same exam or a subset of it again. And I tell you, there's a huge amount of learning that goes on in that group. When people are wanting to get the right answer and they're working in their groups that they trust. I also mentioned some issues about the markings. The marks still are dramatically set by their individuals. Because that still is important. But they can get an improvement if they work well as a group. So, so this is your toughest group test. I have no idea what that says, but from your reaction, not what I wanted. <laughs> so create two lists. This one I think is the hardest. You've got to figure out what you're going to give up. What teaching activity will you reduce or remove for free of time? You cannot put this on top of all the things you're already doing. So you have to determine what thing you can let go of that isn't helping learning so that you can do this. One action that you will take in the next week. All right, please go. You only have 10 minutes, though. Thank you so much. I hate interrupt you. Because you're having really, obviously, really important discussions. I can say, though, that you can have, keep having those over, over food for lunch. So at this point, we are, we are done, at least this stage. Immediately afterwards, if we could all go out for our official photo, as a, as a you know, permanent memory. If you want to take pictures of your, all your work, please do that. And I would just really like to say, I would really like to say, you know, uh, I want to say, I want to say, and if you have any desire to talk to me by email or Twitter, please do. So thank you, thank you ever so much. Okay. Uh -huh.